All right, so with uh, unit four, remember that with unit four, uh, kind of one of the big themes of unit four is the fact that we're coming off of the War of 1812. We got all this nationalism going and we uh, start to form a more national identity and we start to grow in multiple ways. We don't just grow in terms of culture, like we start writing books and painting paintings that reflect American patriotism and, and American nationalism, all those things. And remember nationalism's kind of like a supercharged version of patriotism. We also start to, can you hear me over the, uh, the uh, leaf blowers? Yes. And okay, good. So anyway, uh, we also start to grow a lot economically and uh, that a lot of those things unite the country because remember different parts of the country are starting to trade with each other and that helps. So um, remember that there's a lot of unity, there's a lot, uh, but underneath all that unity, underneath all that patriotism, there is still kind of swept under the rug, this, this sectionalism, especially over slavery, but not just slavery. It could be political separation too. So right now, during this time, how many political parties do we have? One. Yeah, one. And now the leaf blowers are getting really close. Hopefully that means they'll be really far soon. So Leah, your question will be, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna wait till we get to the items. But remember, there is a president that comes along that kind of breaks the sectionalism up again into two parts and splits the political parties and then eventually slavery becomes a big issue again you got the second great awakening etc cetera, etc cetera. so which president is that that question goes to anybody james monroe well monroe was the one that kind of presided over the arrogant feelings but he goes out and after he goes out another political figure rises to prominence and is really divisive and either people love him or they hate him pretty much and it creates sectionalism Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Can anyone think of a more modern president that has had a similar effect? You either love him or you hate him, and there's not much room in between. Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump. <clears throat> so, and in fact, Donald Trump, whenever he moved into the Oval Office, fun fact is that he went and found like one of the original portraits of Andrew Jackson and had it hung in the uh, Oval Office. Okay, so anyway, moving on to stuff, this stuff. Um, real quickly, okay, Leah, you're the first one. What does antebellum mean? It's Latin, but it means something, obviously. Doesn't it mean like pre-war? Pre-war, before the war. And in this case, it's at, which war is it referring to? The Civil War. The Civil War. So whenever you hear the term antebellum or the antebellum period, it is the time period basically from our country's founding to the Civil War. And some people narrow that time frame, but I pretty much like to say it's everything from Constitution up to Civil War, where we create all these ideals and then are we going to live up to them or not? And then we end up fighting a war related to that. You could really say it goes back to the Declaration of Independence in a sense. So basically, uh, chronologically, we're still in the antebellum period. And the tension right now, it's not like you've seen the picture. The tension's pretty low at this point, but the tension will go up uh, as time goes on. Kind of really, the cracks really break wide open during uh, the... Uh, well, whenever Jackson rises up as a political figure. Now, Leah, a second question. Was everything all good during this era of good feelings? Mm, not really. Uh, for the most part, it kind of was. It seemed like it was, but you could say it's not really because there were some problems. Slavery was still there, and there's a couple of events that happened. One of them you probably don't remember, that's gonna be the panic of 1819. There's a big economic dip and it takes place for a year or two and if we climb out of it, then we're fine. Okay, so Leah, who's going next? Amy. Amy's going next. Okay, Amy, so remember that we've got this nationalism, which is like a strong feeling of patriotism and it is going to be, it's not like it says there, sectionalism's still there. It's just kind of on the back burner as being overshadowed 
by this feeling of, of nationalism. And a good way to put that is, and you all aren't old enough to remember this, but I remember right after 9-11 happened, you had Republicans and Democrats getting along very well. You had Republicans and Democrats literally singing God Bless America together on the steps of the Capitol building. And there's a lot of national unity. Uh, even people that were Democrats were highly approving of George W. Bush and his approval rating hit like 90% right after 9-11 because of his leadership right afterwards. Okay, so we've had periods like that. But today, could you imagine Republicans and Democrats getting along like that? No, not really. Or a president's approval rating being 90%. That's the highest. I don't think it's been that high since. Okay, so Amy's my person to, to pick on right now. Amy, I want you to look at this painting because I know I've shown this painting a couple times. How does this painting show, look at it and tell me how it kind of reflects nationalism? Um. What I used to tell my students is you basically look at something, the painter doesn't put something in there without meaning. Heck, I just noticed something I've never seen before. So here's your obvious one. Why does that reflect nationalism? Um, well, I guess it could be like pride. National pride, waving the flag, but look how big the flag is. It's not a small flag. The, the uh, staff here is taller than the guy holding it. Okay, what about this? Um, Who's he being crowned by, it looks like? Angelic figure, perhaps? Yeah. If that's the case. What's God saying about the United States? Um, he's saying that um, let me put it this way if God came to send an angel to put a, a wreath on your head, what would that say about you? I guess that you're doing something good. Yeah, and that God is favoring you and maybe your nation. And then you'll notice here it says, we owe allegiance to no crown. So again, if you look down here, our chains are broken. We are no longer connected to Europe. Remember when I made that, or I, I talked about how we're kind of turning away from the old world and looking to the new world. Well, our chains to the old world are being broken. And I just now noticed this, but look, he's stomping on the crown. So yeah, there's a lot of pro-American patriotism going on. So, so strong that it would be described not as patriotism, but as nationalism. Now, is there such thing as becoming too patriotic, too nationalistic? Just a yes or no. Yes. There is. If you get, like, there's like a spectrum, if you will. You got patriotism, nationalism, but when you get to the point of what's called jingoism, that's when you don't care what your country does. You don't care if what your country does is right or wrong, so long as it's good for your country. And that's the sort of feeling that you saw in Germany when Hitler rose to power. They started invading other countries and taking them over and you know, harassing minorities. But so long as it was good for the country, people that were like basically blinded by this supersized nationalism called jingoism, they were just fine with it. So keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that in America too. Okay. Another, the painting's still there, so we can't go over that. So Amy, who's going next? Addy. Addy. So Addy, the era of good feelings is basically the time period. It's after the War of 1812. It pretty much happens during James Monroe's presidency. So Monroe inherited a really nice situation. He was a pretty popular president. 
And a lot of it didn't have to do <clears throat> with what he was doing. It just had to do with the fact that he was there when things were good and people said, oh, he must be a good president as a result. So as you see there, there is a lot of national pride. We'll talk about that more. There is a lot of economic growth because what are we gonna start building in the North, for example? Like factories. And more and more factories. And uh, the factories are gonna be producing stuff for other parts of the nation. So kind of keep that in mind. And there's gonna be like a trade network between the different regions. And uh, if I could record, I don't know how to record myself going up to the whiteboard and drawing something or else I would to help explain that. But let's go to, let me ask you a couple questions. Number one, economic growth. There's a revolution in economics in the United States. Addie, do you remember the name of that revolution? No, I don't remember. Anyone want to help her out? Is it literally what's in front of us, the era of good feelings? No. Nope. What did you say, Jason? No. Industrial revolution. Well, there's that too. There's the industrial revolution. There's a lot of inventions there, the American system. But it all fosters what's known as the market revolution. And I'll go more into that later. So I'm still on Addy. Addy, can you tell me an example of something that happened during the era of good feelings that didn't make people feel so good? Like something that is kind of rough or tension had tension with it. Um, Has to do with the land of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, wasn't it? Um, like the westward land like um they wanted to expand slavery over there who did but, um like pe like pro-slavery people there was a particular territory that wanted to become a state um henry clay had to step in to fix this was it Missouri? It was Missouri. So Missouri wants to come in as a slave state. All of a sudden, it looks like the balance is going to be thrown off. And then the Missouri Compromise says, okay, we'll bring in Missouri as a slave state so long as Maine comes in as a free state. And that was solving for the time being. And there's more parts of the compromise we'll get into later, but solve for the time being the issue of slavery in the West. So there were some hiccups in the air of good feelings, but overall things seemed pretty good. Okay, so one example of the nationalism is that is can be seen in painting in artwork and it wasn't just in, in in painting it was also in literature and poetry and all that other all the other kinds of, of artwork uh, you're going to start seeing an americanized version of it you're going to see books that take place in the united states or that their their plot does you're going to see stories that reflect american themes like individualism and things like that okay so one of the more famous examples of, of this artistic nationalism will be the creation of the Hudson River School, which was a group of American painters that basically said, you know what, we've been painting pictures of the English countryside or the Swiss Alps or whatever, uh, all these things in Europe. Why don't we embrace and paint the beauty that exists here in the United States? So for example, who's going next? Um, Tara. Tara. Tara, you're lucky because I think you got an easy one. One of their examples of showing something that is of natural beauty that is in the United States, unique to the United States, that is not in uh, Europe is this right here. Do you know what that's a painting of? Is it Niagara Falls? It is Niagara Falls. Okay, I can't see you, but tell me, has anyone been to Niagara Falls? Yes, sir, last summer. How was that? Awesome. It is amazing. And if you go down the boat that takes you right at the base of the falls, it's even more amazing. I don't know if you did that or not. The horseshoe, yeah. You did? Yeah. Okay, so I've done that too. 
it is it is just so all inspiring it almost looks like it's fake because it's just so big and all that but no it's a natural phenomenon and uh again uh, that's something that's unique to the united states and we started to take pride in that whenever i go traveling uh, you can almost say i have a little bit of nationalism because although someday i plan to travel overseas like to iceland or to uh, new zealand or something like that right now i'm so satisfied with what i can go and you know the backpacking i can do in the united states that I'm not done with it yet because there's so much there. So again, there's a lot of nationalism reflected in the artwork, but also in our own natural beauty. Okay, so on to John Marshall. Uh, who just went? It was Tara. Tara, who's next? Hi, Lynn. Who is? Rylan. Oh, is it Raylan or Rylan? Rylan. Okay, I was just making sure that I wasn't mispronouncing someone's name all year. Uh, okay, so Rylan, you got a little bit of a tougher one. So John Marshall, and I'll guide you through it. So John Marshall becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Remember, he's the one that strengthens the Supreme Court uh, with judicial review of the Marbury versus Madison case. But he also, during the era of good feelings, because there's more national unity and less sectionalism, people weren't as vocal about states rights if you will they're more okay with the growing power of the federal government although not for long and there are cracks in that that will get blown apart whenever people like andrew jackson come along so i talked about two rulings uh they're coming up that there were two rulings uh that john marshall did that were uh considered expanding of the federal government's power that I mentioned, there's actually other ones besides that. And honestly, Ryland, I, I'm get, since I'm getting ready to go over it, uh, I might end up sticking with you for a couple slides. But one of these was uh, about the Bank of the United States. Under John Marshall, the Supreme Court's gonna say the Bank of the United States is, which one, constitutional or unconstitutional? He said that it was constitutional. He did, which is noteworthy because that strengthens the power of the federal government because now you have a federally run, basically, uh, bank that regulates the entire nation's economy. Do you remember what state it was that tried to attack that? Uh, Maryland, I believe. It was. Am I good to go ahead or do y'all need me to wait? Okay, I'll go ahead. So you got McCulloch versus Maryland. Maryland tries to tax, and remember, Maryland was a Southern state, had more Democratic Republicans. They were trying to tax the Bank of the United States branches that were in Maryland. And they said that the power to tax is the power to destroy. And so they said, you can't tax it. And again, saves the Bank of the United States, basically says that it's constitutional. And, uh, and of course, that increases the federal government's power. Now, Ryan, your last question is, there is going to be a president that comes along that, regardless of this ruling, says the Bank of the United States is not constitutional, and he's going to destroy it, at least for a time be the time being. Ryan, who is that? Andrew Jackson. Very good. Now, Ryan, go ahead and pick someone else. Um, Logan. Kate okay, Logan. Uh, again, am I going too fast? Are y'all ready? Slow me down if I'm going too fast. The other big case that came out of John Marshall, Logan, was Gibbons versus Ogden. And if you remember, there was this case where basically New York said that the inventor of the steamboat, Robert Fulton, could use the Hudson River, but the Hudson River wasn't just part of New York. It also bordered, I believe, New Jersey and maybe another state. Congress said, no, somebody else can use it. So if there is a form of trade that crosses between states, do the states have power over it, Logan, or does the federal government have power over it? Um, at that point, I believe it was that the states would have power over it. The states tried to until this case. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I'd say it's, they, it's probably controlled by federal power. Yes, federal power, and you need to remember this right here, what I'm circling, the federal government still has authority over interstate commerce, any trade that's going on over state lines. 
So guess who's responsible for distributing the coronavirus vaccine across state lines? The federal government. Federal government. Logan, have you ever flown before? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know how I have to go through all those security checkpoints? Mm-hmm. With TSA, TSA where are those officers that are wearing the blue uniforms and checking, you know, to make sure that everything's safe. That is part of uh, TSA is part of the federal government because airplanes operate between states. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way to remember that is look at tractor trailers on the interstates. Is trade going on on the interstates? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's. This is almost like too obvious. What's the name of the roads that travel between the states that the tractor trailers use? And interstate. Interstate. So there again, interstate means between the states. They're trading between the states. And the federal government can regulate the interstate highways. For example, one thing that happened in the 1980s is that drunk driving became a big deal. And so some people said we needed to raise the drinking age to cut down on drunk driving. For some people, uh, the, the legal age was only 18. And to try to cut down on drunk driving, the federal government said, Every state needs to up its its uh, legal drinking age to 21, and some states didn't want to do that. So, what ends up happening is that the federal government says, "Okay, if you don't want to uh, raise the drinking age to where we want it, we just won't fund the interstates in your state." Did every state fall in line? I I presume so. They did. They did because the federal government uses power over interstate commerce to kind of coerce the states. And they're going to do, you're going to see interstate commerce come into play a lot more in American too. So be ready for that. Okay. On to another subject, Logan, who's next? Um, I'll pick Aiden. You said Aiden. Okay. So Aiden, there is going to be a dispute between Spanish owned Florida and the Southern part of the United States. The Southern part of the United States is upset with the fact that, uh, with the fact that uh, slaves are running away into Spanish Florida, they were upset that some of the Native Americans were attacking settlers along the border. Some American settlers were kind of asking for it because they were crossing the border into uh, Spanish Florida, which they weren't supposed to do. Regardless, things are getting chaotic between the United States and Spanish-owned Florida. So, at this point, James Monroe. Aiden is going to send who to make sure that things are settled down in Florida. Is it is in the name of the treaty? Is it Adam? John, that's uh, John Quincy Adams. He was the Secretary of State at the time. Uh, that's why the treaty is named after him. He actually defended this man's actions when he went down to Florida and did not listen to his orders. And he basically like burned, I think he burned uh, Native American villages and he found the governor, the Spanish governor of Florida and he captured him and held him hostage basically. All these things could have led to war with Spain. They did it anyway, because he didn't mess around. Who's our famous soon to be president that didn't mess around, Aiden? Uh, Andrew Johnson. Close. Andrew Jackson. Yeah, Andrew Jackson. Very different people. Names are similar, but their personalities are totally different. So Andrew Jackson is going to go in there. And a lot of people are really mad about this, thinking a war might start. And interestingly, John Quincy Adams was the one of the only people in the presidential cabinet that actually defended his actions, which is interesting because they're about to run for president against each other. So Adams is going to say to Spain, look, you weren't taking care of business in Florida. It was causing us problems. If you can't take care of business there and keep it from causing us problems, then you should sell us Florida. And Spain didn't really want to mess with Florida anymore anyway because they didn't find gold there. So they sold Florida to us. But Andrew Jackson kind of forced the issue. And again, this feeds into him becoming kind of a national hero where he'll have some uh, strength when he runs for election. Okay, Aiden, who's next? Parker. Parker. Parker, you got one of the ones that people forget, but it's a big deal. 
Remember that the Monroe Doctrine is going to say that basically if anybody is going to do any new settling in the new world, it's going to be the United States. Do you know why we said that? In other words, what prompted President Monroe to say nobody's messing with the United States? They didn't want like any other countries trying to take land from them. Was that happening up to this point? Um... Yes or no? I don't think so. They were. Especially, you'll notice that one of Uncle Sam's feet is on Alaska here. Russia was starting to creep down from Alaska, close to land that we owned. We didn't like that. Remember, we just kicked Spain out of Florida. So we were basically, it's like we put a barbed wire fence around the Americas and said, this is ours now. Could we really enforce it? No, we were too weak of a nation at this point. But nobody called our bluff. And that's going to come up later on, like, for example, during the Civil War, I don't think I told you all this, but during the Civil War, while we were fighting against ourselves, Napoleon III, who was a relative of the Napoleon, wanted to invade Mexico. And we basically said, Monroe Doctrine, can't do that. And, and uh, basically, Napoleon III backed off, and I think that Mexico helped fight him off. That might be where Cinco de Mayo, the holiday, comes from, but I'm not sure. Uh, so don't quote me on that one. But anyway, uh, basically we're saying we own this area. And uh, who am I talking to again? Is it Parker? Yes. Okay, Parker, I'm going to ask you to think hard on this one. This idea that this land is now open just to us and nobody, if, if they have colonies, they can keep them, but they can't have any more. So we're basically saying the rest of this belongs to us. If anyone's going to settle more, it's going to be us. There's going to be an idea that comes along pretty soon that's going to say it's our duty almost to take over this land. Manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. And, you know, manifest destiny ended up being, you know, going to the West Coast. But initially, some people were thinking about taking more of Mexico, maybe even going to South America someday. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. There's uh, the beautiful Henry Clay. Henry Clay was very forward thinking. He was very smart. And he noticed how the country was evolving. And he said, okay, Hamilton's plan had some good parts, but we need to tweak it because now we're a growing nation. So he says, we need to build an economy that is not just a local economy where you go down the street and buy stuff. Now we need to make a national economy that might unite the different areas of the country and prevent sectionalism. So he's going to say, let's uh, build roads. And you see this here, we'll talk about more, I think later, all these roads and canals that get built to connect the different areas of the country so that they could all trade with each other. So again, you're not just buying locally, you're buying from other parts of the nation. He does want to have a tariff. He wants to increase the tariff so that the factories can grow even more. He wants to bring back the Bank of the United States, which had expired by this point. And he wants to build trade routes, basically old school version of the interstate highway system. Except back then it would have been canals, roads, and railroads. If we have, say, canals and railroads that start going out west, are people going to be willing to move out west? Wait, am I still on the same person? Parker, pick somebody. Uh, ish. Ish, okay. So ish, if there's, you know, if before the they start building all of these roads and canals, if you lived way out here, you're in the middle of nowhere. But if you got a railroad that connects you or a canal that connects you back east, might you move out there? <clears throat> yeah I would say so because you could still live out there but make a product and sell it back east and then the eastern factories could send you the tools that you need to produce these things like steel plows mechanical reapers or if they're sending stuff down south which you can't see in this picture they might be sending cotton gins mm -hmm. so I'll come back to that in a second uh, Ish pick somebody 
Um, I'll pick Casey. Okay, Casey, now you get the map without it being co halfway covered up. So remember that there's going to be a transportation revolution that takes place where basically people are going to be trading all across the nation. Now, you haven't learned this, I don't think, because it gets taught in civics, but there's the concept of a market. A market is a place where things are bought and sold. Before all these roads, railroads, canals, and all that were built, Casey, if you wanted to buy a piece of clothing and you live, say, North Carolina, where are you going to get it? For railroads or any sort of transportation, you would have to get it from your own colony. Right, you have to get it, well, states now, but yeah, you'd have to get it from your own local area. Someone would have to hand make it. It probably would be more expensive because they had to hand make it. But once the railroads come along and the other roads and canals come along, these factories are mass producing clothing. Just, just you know, when I say mass producing, I mean, they're, they're shooting out new shirts every day, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of shirts every day. Are you going to be able to buy cheaper ones from up north? Yes. What's going to enable you to do that? Because there's transportation now and there's they're easily made and there's so many of them. Yeah, so basically the transportation is going to allow for that trade to happen. So if you look here, there's trade going on all over the country. In a sense, will that unite the north and the west and the south? Yes. So now the market of where things are being bought and sold, the market's not down the road to where someone's making clothes. Now the market is a national market where things are being bought and sold across the, the nation. Today, we live in an international market where things are bought and sold outside our borders. Look how many things are made in China and other places of Southeast Asia, for example. We also have a new, what's that? I, said, I believe there's a term for that, if I'm not wrong. I think it's like specialism. Is, it, is that right? Where I mean, you got division of labor and specialization that comes along with this, but that's more of a civics thing. Okay. There is a term that you could use, in, and uh, that is kind of a, a word that makes some people, some people are cool with, some people get nervous with it, and that's the word globalism. But basically today, you know, we sell, buy and sell stuff across the globe. And some people feel like that's a threat to the United States independence. So that could be a debated political issue that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but one thing to note about this is who has the most internal improvements? Or let me put it another way, who has at least a number of internal improvements? Is it still me? Uh, go ahead, since you're on this bullet. Okay, um, it would be the south. Yeah, the southern area. Southern area doesn't get as many internal improvements. So they don't really like the plan. They don't like the fact that there's going to be tariffs, which the South hates. The tariffs are going to create these internal improvements. But what about the West? Is the West cool with tariffs if it gives them more internal improvements? Yes. And that's when the West starts to leave the kind of leave their alliance with the South and starts to join up more with the North. And that comes into play more later on, the relationship between the North and the West, which I think I'm about to elaborate on. Yes. Okay, uh, Casey, pick somebody. Uh, Sai. You said Sai? Yes, sir. Okay, so Sai, uh, remember that whenever the factories start to pop up, in let's say you live in New York, and you've got a farm, or not a farm, you've got a uh, like a blacksmith shop, are you going to be able to compete with the factories that are putting out those, those uh, tools faster than you can make them at a cheaper price? No. No. So you got two choices. One choice is you shut down your shop and you go work in the factory. And because you're poor, they're going to take advantage of you and you're going to work in terrible conditions. Or what's your other option? Move out west. Perfect. I'm impressed with that one. A lot of people wouldn't get that one. So yeah, you move out west where there is better land. And lo and behold, the factories are starting to pump out steel plows and mechanical reapers. So will you be able to make a living farming? Yes. Okay. You can make really big farms with these new tools. And so you can go out west 
And by the way, the people that try to keep on farming in, in the northern part, the New England area, they basically they get put out of business by these big farmers that can produce a whole lot more. So they have to choose whether or not they're going to join a factory or go out west too. Now, so the steel plow allows you to, to uh, plant large amounts of crops. The mechanical reaper allows you to reap or to harvest a lot of these crops. So Cy, one uh, last kind of, of uh, sequence of questioning here. This has to do with the trade relationship between the West and the North and what kind of brings them together. Why is there such demand in the New England, the Northern area for these, the products of these big farms? Wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. Let me, let me say it a little bit differently. Okay, if you got a factory, you're gonna to need to build your factories in the cities or you're gonna build a factory in a city. Oh, I got it. Okay, yeah. So you want I to got you. Um, it's important because all of the people that work at the factories, since they're gonna be living like right next to the factories, like if there's a mill or something like that, since everybody's crowded together, you have to have food to supply those people with, which comes from the West, if I'm not wrong. You're correct. And remember that if you're in a city, if you've been in a city, are there like cornfields in the middle of cities? No. 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 So you got to get it from somewhere else. There's no room for it. So they get it from the West. Now, one more piece, Sai. You're being very, very impressive here. Uh, what does the North have to offer the Western farmers? Uh, they have the, the plow and the reaper to start off easy yeah. uh and then clothes to wear you remember this one so well yeah okay so they're producing this wear they're producing what wait the clothes the clothes the reapers the plow oh in the factories up north yeah so you see how they now have a trade relationship that spans the nation Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also remember that they're sending cotton gins down to, from their factories down to the south, and the south is sending cotton back up to the northern textile mills to be turned into cloth clothing. So you see how it's all this big network of trade. It's like triangular trade, but not on the Atlantic Ocean, but in the eastern United States now. Same idea, and it brings them together. But because it seems to favor the north more, it does create sectionalism a little bit too. Okay, good job, Sai. Who you got next? Let's go with Jason. I don't know if he's gone. Okay, so I've got everybody here according to my numbers. So Jason, are you there? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So tell me why the cotton gin was so such a uh, impactful invention. Well, um, it was created, uh, Eli Whitney created it to um, hopefully lessen slavery in the South. It's the but idea it, of automation replacing physical labor. Yeah, but um, it could produce cotton like 50 times faster and it had the opposite effect. It had the opposite effect. So basically uh, it increased the need for slavery. If you look at the maps on the right, you can see that slave population growing over time. Now, one, and by the way, look at Western Virginia. See any uh, much slavery there? No, it's one of the reasons they broke off from Virginia during the Civil War. And you don't have slavery in all this area. Did I ever point that out to you all? Why is there that big gap? There's a reason. This is, oh, where my mouse go? This is where the Appalachian Mountains are. Can't grow uh, cotton in the mountains. The mountain people weren't a big fan of slavery. Now, one other thing, and this is really interesting, uh, talking about elections. Now, there, there, there is some news coming out of Georgia where they, there might be a scandal going on where it might actually end up flipping to Trump. I just saw the news on that today. I don't, I, I don't know enough about it to really talk about it, although I saw a headline about that. But one thing I thought was really interesting 
this is a side note, but I think it's pretty interesting and topical. I was looking, you know how you can look at a county map of the United States, see how every county voted, if they voted more Democrat or Republican. Um, the black vote overwhelmingly these days goes to Democrats. And if you were to lay a map of the votes over this map where slavery used to be, did the black population stay high in these areas? Anybody? Most likely, yeah. Yeah. And guess what? Uh, you saw a lot of counties, especially right through here and along the Mississippi River, that were very blue, Democrat, because the uh, descendants of these slaves went and voted Democrat. And there was enough in Georgia to where, at this point, Georgia became a Democrat voting state instead of a Republican voting state. South Carolina, not so much, uh, even though there are a ton of slaves there. Uh, this, this little uh, light area here, that's about where Columbia is. Actually, no, that doesn't make sense. Because Columbia would vote Democrat, probably. I can't explain South Carolina. But anyway, a lot, it, there's a lot of a correlation between how slavery existed back then and where the black vote is now and how they vote Democrat. I wish I could pull that up, but I haven't found a map yet. I saw it on TV, but I haven't seen it on the internet yet. Anyway, so let's remember one thing is that the North was not innocent in all this because the, the North had demand for textile mills. Britain had demand from their textile mills. The cotton gin helped keep up with that demand, but to keep up with the cotton gin's demand, they needed more slaves. So Britain and the North were responsible for slavery in an indirect way as well. Keep that in mind. The North wasn't innocent with slavery. It's kind of like how we wear clothing that was made in sweatshops in China, uh, but because we don't see it every day, we don't feel so bad, but we still kind of do that out of sight, out of mind. Okay, uh, Jason, who's next? Um, Haley. Who is? Haley, I think. Haley, okay. Yeah, Haley hasn't gone yet. So Haley, um, if you look here, it's talking about the first industrial revolution. There will be a second industrial revolution in the years after the Civil War, which we will talk about in the first unit of American II. Um, so before the Civil War, AKA the antebellum period, you will see a growth in factories thanks to Samuel Slater stealing basically the idea of textile mills from England. And I think I might've told you there are three Asians that happened. So let's see if you can figure this out, uh, Haley. All three of these words rhyme. You have industrialization, which leads to the growth of factories because factories are gonna be where the cities are. What do you call growth of cities? Um, urbanization. Urbanization, okay. And which group of people tended to move to the cities besides Americans? Which group of people tend to move to the cities to work in the factories? Uh, like German and Irish immigrants. We got immigration. So urbanization and, and industrialization and immigration all kind of have a common denominator. They all kind of go together. Okay. Now, you said Germans. There might have been some Germans in the factories, but remember the Germans weren't so poor when they came over. So a lot of them actually moved to the Western part and... Uh, made uh, farms or started businesses. The Irish though were starving because of the potato famine. They were the ones that were more desperate and more willing to work in the factories. And if you notice here, it says number of spindles. So this is basically re referring to textile mills. And my dad actually worked in a textile mill for almost 30 years. And you'll notice that almost all of them are in the New England area. There are a few scattered out in the South, but by far they're, they're in the New England area. Is that gonna feed the New England area's desire to become or have the federal government protect industry and business? Yes, which means some more tariff disputes. South doesn't want them. Okay. Um, and remember that since most of the industrialization happened in the northern part of the country, when the Civil War comes, they're the ones that can produce all the weapons they needed, unlike the South. Okay, Haley, who's going next? Uh, let me see. Uh, has Ava not gone? No, Ava hasn't gone yet. 
Okay, Ava. So one of the very first famous examples of, in, of internal improvements, by the way, uh, side note is that Henry Clay proposed internal improvements, but people like Monroe and Madison, uh, the more Democratic Republican states rights people, they said the federal government shouldn't get involved in, in, in internal improvements, the state should make it. So New York says, okay, if the federal government's not gonna build a canal for us, we'll build our own and they do. And there you see highlighted and what color it is, I don't know, is it like a dark blue? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the dark blue represents Erie Canal. And you can see that there are other canals that are kind of built too. Uh, but the Erie Canal is going to connect, you know, it uses the Hudson River too, but it basically connects New York City and Albany, New York, where, you know, basically where the cities are, to the West. So will people, Ava, be willing to move out West into this area? Yes. And what do they do when they're there? What do they usually do for a living? Um, Think about what Sai was saying. Um, like industry? The industrialization is happening in the cities where you have enough workers. You don't have enough workers out here. You gave me an answer, so I'll let Sai try to help you out on this one. People do what for a living more in this area, Sai? Uh, wait, where is that? Is that New York? Western New York, yeah. Keyword Western New York. Um, that means that they'd be more what farmlands and stuff like that. Yeah, they do more farming, and then they would use the canal Ava to send their farm goods to the cities. So again, this is an example of internal improvements. Um, my mom is actually, if you look at, if you're looking at the mouse, my mom is from yeah, somewhere like right there, right on the Erie Canal. Not in Rochester, about 30 minutes from Rochester. But yeah, that's where my mom's from. Also, that is where the Latter-day Saints got their movement really started. And that this was all known as the burned over district when the second Great Awakening was going on. The more on that later. Okay, so finally, uh, Ava picked somebody. Reagan. Reagan, and at this point, I think we've gotten everybody because we've got 16 of you in round number 16. Although, no, I think I went with two slides with somebody. So maybe we got one more person. Okay, so this is a big deal, uh, Reagan. There is a revolution in market. So can you remember what I said a market is? Um, where people go to like buy clothes and stuff. Buy and sell anything. Like for example, a modern day example of a market would be amazon.com, eBay. That's a, a digital market, if you will. And it's actually, start, it's another market revolution because people are buying and selling stuff online. In fact, during the pandemic, uh, Amazon sales have gone through the roof. And that's putting a lot of your regular stores out of business. You've been ever been to Signal Hill Mall, it's pretty much a ghost town now. Uh, so if you look here, there is a revolution in the market because people are buying and selling stuff where, Reagan? Um, in the north. People in the north are selling stuff to people where? Um, in the south. In the south. Cotton gins. They're selling stuff to people in the west. Where are they selling to people in the west? Um... Animals? Not animals. You can't store cows in New York City. Oh. It's, the, it's the other way around. The West is sending animals like, like beef. Uh, by the way, Chicago Bulls, why are they called the Chicago Bulls? Well, that used to be where a lot of uh, beef was produced. They'd raise the cows. Like some to Chicago, but that's that's American too as well. Okay, so they're sending like livestock, or at least the 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 cut meats from livestock. They're sending crops over to the north. 
and of course the north is sending back things like cotton or, or things like uh mechanical reapers and uh steel plows okay and i think i said already that the north is sending cotton gins down south the south is sending cotton up north where's the cotton going up north to what kind of factory textile mills perfect okay and then the north also uses these textile mills and sewing machines to send clothing to other areas so instead of going just down the road to buy your stuff you're getting your stuff shipped by the new transportation systems from other states. And that is a revolution of markets because now the market is basically everywhere that people have settled up to this point. The entire nation, you have, like it says there in all caps, a national economy. The areas of the country are interdependent, meaning they depend on each other for different items. Does that unite the nation? Yes. But eventually, if you look down here, uh, it's, if I showed you the whole map, this would be color coded, this yellow looking part, I think it's yellow, that's cotton. And eventually the North's gonna say, yeah, you, make, you give us cotton, but we do not agree with how you get your cotton made. And that's gonna be the slavery issue. So eventually this will lead to some tension instead of unity, it kind of did both. In some ways it united, in some ways it created uh, sectionalism. So Reagan, who's our last person that hasn't gone? Or does that person just want to say their name? It's me. I thought you, oh, you, you did say something, but it was. It was yeah, me. I've just been talking randomly. Yeah, randomly. Okay, you get to do urbanization. Okay. Sure. Rockman, uh, remember urbanization goes together with what other two Asians? Uh, immigration and industrialization. Very good, you see it there and here. But the thing is, think about, think about if a city grows fast, like people move to a city before the city's ready for it and it grows too fast, that causes problems. Okay, can you think of any places in Iredell County where growth has been so big that they've struggled to adjust to it? Iredell County? Mm -hmm. Tell me a place where urbanization, urbanization has taken off and that urban area is struggling to adjust to the growing population. Is it Mooresville? Mooresville is the best example I can think of. Y'all have probably driven in Mooresville, try to get off exit 36 most days. It's completely crowded. They just recently did things in like the crossroads area of Statesville to make the traffic flow better. But yeah, whenever you have a lot of people coming to one place at once, it's hard to adjust to it. So you got overcrowding issues. And that's a big deal whenever you have Americans moving to work in the factories and immigrants moving to work in the factories, you're gonna see nativism, discrimination, the idea that, that uh, jobs are being stolen and all that. So that creates uh, tension, discrimination based tension. You do see an increase in crime because were these people in the factories being paid very much, Rockman? Not a lot. The, they even had uh, riots over it, right? Yeah, eventually, yeah, we'll talk more about unions and riots of, of, the, of the unions. Mm -hmm. uh, this here, in the, this mm -hmm. picture is supposed to be gangs fighting. I think it's like basically a picture of gangs in New York, if you've ever seen that movie, or if anybody has. So with poverty, you usually see crime. People don't just wake up one day and say, hmm, I'm going to go steal something because I want to. It's usually I'm more desperate, and I'm trying to find a way to survive, and they resort to crime. So that, that happens more in the cities. And poverty is, I think, pretty common in a lot of the cities. And then, of course, sanitation issues, because guess what we don't have? Sewers. So people literally pile their crap in the streets. So that's a nice picture to look at before lunchtime, right? Just imagine what it'd be like if there's a heavy rain right before all that. So the cities were not ready. They slowly did adjust, though, and cities are much cleaner and I, if I remember correctly, crime in most cities has gone down. I know New York City had a big drop in crime for a long time. I'm not sure what it is now, but they did have a big drop in crime. Uh, Chicago is struggling with gun violence a lot, but a lot of cities are a lot better off than they used to be. Okay. So in the textile mills now, Rockman, you can pick anybody because we've gone through everybody at least once. I guess so. Sit, Sai. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, I do see someone sent me a chat. I'll wait till we're done before I look at that chat because uh, that might be a private message and I don't I want to stop sharing my screen first. Okay, so uh, Sai, going back to the factories, there was one example of the, of the conditions of the factories and that was Lowell Mills. There's actually a town in Massachusetts called Lowell. And the uh, textile mills there, look what they did. They hired women. Now Sai, according to social norms at the time, were women supposed to be working? outside the home uh, no but the exception would be uh, this factory uh, well actually there were a lot of factories like this oh wait was it um uh single women were able to own land and stuff like that yeah very good so basic well uh they could until they got married and then it went to the husband until they got married yeah, they could also it was acceptable for them to work, especially in things that were considered extensions of the home. So women were known to make clothing for their children. Well, now they're making clothing for other people and other people's children. So if you were single, it was okay. But look, they were heavily controlled. They were watched 24-7 so that their purity could be monitored, if you will. Uh, they lived in dorms that were right next to the factory. And it was a pretty nasty area they actually had a couple strikes their conditions were so bad and uh, once they got married though their role was to go to the home be a mother homemaker clean things all the stereotypical things people have associated with american women for most of american history but when they were single they were taken advantage of in the, in the sense that they were working in these factories in poor conditions i'll talk a whole lot more about working conditions and the response to that in american too Okay, American one and two do go well together. Okay, Sa, who's going next? Casey. Casey. Okay, Casey, if you look at the map at the top, you can see that there were some areas that very closely resemble that map I was looking at earlier with the cotton gin, where I talked about how people vote Democrat. This is where the descendants of slaves uh, live still today especially along the Mississippi, because you could put your cotton on a barge on the Mississippi, for example. But look, over 50% of the population of some of these areas were enslaved. That's quite a hypocrisy when you think about the idea of you know, freedom and democracy and all men being created equal being our founding principles. So kind of keep that hypocrisy in mind. And there you see just a, a generic descript, uh, depiction of, of cotton harvesting. Now, Cotton was so big that it got nicknamed the Cotton Kingdom because basically all of their investment for the most part was in cotton, which is dangerous because if you only have cotton, that means you're not producing stuff in factories. That means you're not producing corn or wheat or things that can be used or livestock, that, things that can be eaten. And they are overly reliant on just one thing. And this is kind of related, but if you ever decide to invest in stocks, and this goes to everybody, if you ever decide to invest in stocks, uh, they always say invest in more than one. Because if you invest in five and two of them go down, but three of them go up, you end up gaining. But if you only invest in one, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. It could be a disaster. And that's pretty much what the, the, uh, the Southerners were doing with cotton. So it got so big that I was nicknamed the Cotton Kingdom. Now, Casey, here's your question. People said it's the Cotton Kingdom. They also use the phrase cotton is king. Obviously, cotton was king of the South. But in what other sense could you say cotton was king? King of what else? Um, I want to say slavery. Not slavery. Think who got the most cotton that was produced in the South. I'm sorry, I don't really understand what you're asking me. When they produce the cotton, they're not gonna keep it, they're gonna sell it, who are they selling it to? The North so they can produce it in factories. That is the, a right answer, but the problem is you didn't tell me who they sold most of it to. It wasn't to the North. There's some place that got even more of it. It's not in the United States. Britain. to britain 
So remember in, war, in uh, the Civil War, I talked about how Britain considered joining the South. A lot of that had to do with that trade relationship, and they wanted to keep getting that, that cotton. We produce more cotton than any place in the world at this point in the South. Okay, who's going next? Um, Leah. Leah? Okay, Leah. So uh, basically what happens is that, you know, the South is going to try to come up with junk arguments why slavery is a good thing and how it's good for them. It keeps them civilized. They get their clothing and their food and their shelter for free and all these things that are really misleading, if not just straight up untrue. And the, the interesting thing is, if the slaves had it so good, then why are they running away? Why are they having rebellions like Turner's Rebellion, which we'll talk about later. And so every time there's a rebellion, and who, who was I talking to again? Is it Leah? Yes. Okay, Leah. If Leah, if there's all these rebellions going on, people running away, what is the slave owner reaction to that? Like their reaction from their slaves running away? Yeah, or rebelling or anything. Anything that's, that the owners didn't like. Well, I guess like, they wouldn't like that because then they'd be like, proving that they are in great condition. Well, they would do that to try to make the North get off their back, but what would they do to keep the, the slaves controlled? Look at what it says here. Oh, they kept, um, they made laws to restrict their freedoms. Right. And the more that they rebelled, the slaves did, the stricter the slave codes got. So they weren't allowed to learn how to read or write, which kept them ignorant of literacy, kept them illiterate, which made them hard, harder for them to join up with each other. They could not, after Nat Turner's Rebellion, even assemble with each other unless they had supervision from a slave owner. And there are other things, too, like they couldn't own guns because what would a slave do is the moment they had a gun, probably shoot the slave owner. So the slave code, every time there's a rebellion, the slave codes get stricter. And this, don't, don't take this comparison in a, in a bad way, but imagine a classroom, because, you know, students obviously are not slaves, but imagine a classroom where uh, the teacher is getting frustrated because the students aren't behaving or they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing uh, work-wise. Is that teacher, if they want that class to succeed, going to get stricter? No. I do. <laughs> like I had a class and they wouldn't stop talking at all. Whenever I was at North, they wouldn't stop talking at all. Uh, so I basically said, okay, today you get after school dis detention if you say a word. And I did that for two days straight and they hated it. And I gave out like eight detentions to one class period, but it did stop them from misbehaving. Uh, so that's not the greatest of comparisons because I would not like to be considered a slave owner. I'm not like to consider my students to be slaves, but the idea of if the people that you're trying to manage are not being manageable, then you get stricter. And that's what happens here. You do understand, ladies and gentlemen, I can't see your faces, but you do understand that I'm not saying that students are slaves, right? Or that I'm a slave owner. That's clear, right? Yes. Yeah, you got one person saying yes. Yeah. You're fine. I, I can hear you freaking out, Mr. Mitchell. You're good. We got you. Got it. Good. We understand. No, I've had students take things like that out of context and try to get me in trouble. That's why I freak out about it. Okay, it actually didn't happen that long ago and it's completely unfair, but obviously I was showed that they were being taking things out of context. Anyway, thank you, Cy. Thank you, Rockman and whoever else understands. Uh, well, it's the point I was trying to make. Um, who just went? It was uh, Leah. So Leah, who's going next? Reagan. Reagan, okay, Reagan. We've talked about sectionalism before, what it means, but we haven't talked about what made it grow. So remember that towards the end of the era of good feelings, sectionalism starts to come back and it's over slavery and westward expansion. Should we take slavery out west? People are starting to get in the southern states uncomfortable with increased federal power. And the last part says competing visions for the country. 
The North wanted to have what kind of country based off of what? Um, no slavery. Not the North. Like they didn't want slavery? Not, we're not quite there yet. We, we're just starting to see the beginnings of the Second Great Awakening, which I'll talk about more in the, uh, in the next review on Monday. They want their economy to be based off of factories. Factories. And you could also say farming of like edible products, like cows. Well, it's, it's, that's not really farming, but you get the idea. Uh, or corn, things like that. The South, though, they wanted the federal government to defend their quote unquote right to own slavery and continue to produce cotton. That's what it means by competing visions for the country. So every time a new state wants to come in, North and South fight over it. Which one of these, Reagan, would you say, uh, these three things listed, which one do you think most directly contributed to the coming of the Civil War? Um, competing visions for the country. Oh, I'd say something else. Slavery and westward expansion. Remember, Abraham Lincoln said, I don't want to attack slavery. I just don't want to spread westward. That was enough for the South to want to secede. So that would probably be the number one issue. Okay, I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit. I just looked at, at my phone. My clock behind me is completely off. My clock says it's 750. Actually, it just died. It says it's still 750. So I'm using my phone to keep track of time. So I've got five minutes to. Uh, a few more. Okay, so slavery in the West, Reagan, who's going? Or actually, I'm going to stop calling on people. I'm just going to kind of talk, interrupt me if you have a question. Okay, so basically, we got the Louisiana Territory, and then people want to move out there, but guess what? Slavery in the West is a big issue. And Missouri wants to become a state. They want to become a slave state, and the northern states say the heck with that. Then we'll have more southern states than represented in the Senate, and, the, and there will be an imbalance of free and slave states. And then it just so happened that Maine wanted to break away from Massachusetts at the time. And so Henry Clay says, let's put the two together. Missouri becomes a free state, Maine becomes a, or excuse me, a slave state, Maine becomes a free state. But he also says, let's draw this line here, 3630 line. Let's go ahead and say all the land below that can become slave states. All the land above that can become free states. Does that settle the issue of slavery in the West for the time being? Yes, uh, for the time being. Uh, remember, we don't outright own Oregon yet. We don't own this land. This is still considered part of Spain. It's soon to become Mexico, but not yet. Uh, so basically, we own all the way up to this line right here. And we now have a compromise to sell the issue of slavery in the West. Will that compromise be satisfying once abolitionism gets big? Not at all. So keep that in mind. People were willing to put up with slavery even in the North for the most part at this point. There were abolitionists, they just weren't as, they, they, they hadn't gained traction yet. Okay, so on comes the election of 1824. And in this election, no one wins the majority, although Andrew Jackson, pictured at the top, does win the most votes. And, you know, you hear a lot of talk in the news today about people claiming election fraud and other people saying, no, it was okay. It's kind of like that in 24, 1824. So what happens is even though Andrew Jackson gets the, the most electoral votes, he doesn't get the majority of them because it was split among four candidates. And so then it comes down to the House of Representatives. Henry Clay, a good wheeler and dealer, is going to tell all of his colleagues in the House to let John Quincy Adams become president even though he didn't get as many votes as Jackson because they were scared of Jackson because they thought, thought of him as like a out of control backwoods redneck, to be honest. Uh, and so they gave it to John Quincy Adams instead. And then John Quincy Adams turns around and makes Henry Clay his secretary of state. Andrew Jackson sees all this happen. He's furious. He says the election was stolen from him. He calls it a corrupt bargain. And he basically sets up his election for 1828. Now, does that remind you of anything in the news? This election. this election, you've got President Trump is irate about the election results. He's claiming that there has been fraud. Uh, and if he doesn't basically win that argument, which I'm thinking he's not, 
going to win that argument. It's not looking like it, but he's already thinking about running for president. So the rumors go in 2024. So it really, and remember, he idolized Andrew Jackson as well. So that's kind of an interesting modern day comparison. So Andrew Jackson will get his comeback largely because what kind of people like Andrew Jackson? Who did he appeal to? And don't say backwards rednecks. Wasn't it the West? Or... People in the West liked him, yeah. The common man? The common man. The regular people. Your everyday Joes. No Joe Biden pun intended there. But your everyday people, right? And so what happens in between that election and the next election is that universal white male suffrage starts to expand. They start to say, you know what? You don't have to have a lot of property. You can be a common person, average person, and you can still vote so long as you're white and you're male. Andrew Jackson had been an orphan at age 13. He grew up being a quote unquote common man himself. And even though Donald Trump did not grow up poor, has he found a way to relate to the more common people? Anybody on that one? Does he appeal to your average Joes? Are you thinking about being radical? I'm saying, does President Trump appeal to your kind of everyday average American? I guess. I would say so. He doesn't appeal to certain groups. He doesn't appeal to people in the cities. He doesn't appeal to people that have four-year college degrees. Uh, but he does appeal to your more average citizens uh, that make up a lot of the country. Uh, definitely uh, white males also. Um, but my point being is that I'm trying to make that connection, that modern day connection, something that happened before. Okay, so suddenly a lot more people can vote. How are you going to get their votes? All of a sudden, you got to earn their votes. You're going to have to do a lot of campaigning. You're going to have to do a lot of mudslinging. Is President Trump known for doing those two things? Holding big rallies and doing a lot and calling people names. That's what campaigning and mudslinging is. President Trump does that to appeal to the common man. Andrew Jackson did the same thing. Did it work for Andrew Jackson in 1828 once the poor whites could vote? Yes. Yes. How did Trump do with poor whites? In this election, or in 2016 especially. He appealed to them. He appealed to them, and he ended up winning. And he appealed to them again uh, this time, too. Except that it was a little bit different this time because the people that did not like President Trump particip participated a lot more than they did last time. So that's why I saw a change. But definitely the, the people that liked Trump in 2016 came out in force for him in 2020. Same thing for Andrew Jackson. He's going to win election because of the common man. Then he's going to win the second election because of the common man. So finally, election of 1828, you see how overwhelming it was for Andrew Jackson. He won all of the South. He won all of the West, even won sections of the North because he appealed to more common people. And the reason that's a big deal is that he basically was saying this country belongs to everybody, not just elitist people at the top. When his inauguration happened, you had people literally coming out of the woods and having a keg party on the White House lawn. They got so wild that they had to escort Andrew Jackson away for his own safety. Did the common person feel empowered by the election of President Trump? I would argue yes. And if you want to delve deeper into that, you could talk about how in some ways that might be good, in some ways that might be bad, but I'm not going to get into political discussion because that gets pretty uh, tense among people sometimes. And that would just take up a lot of time. And I think I'm out of time. Yeah, I actually just went three minutes over.